Hello, 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 hello. I am here alone at the moment. Uh, so let's give it a few minutes and see uh, if anyone joins me. Uh-oh. What happened to my screen? Okay. I'm going to share my screen with you, I think. Yeah. Okay, so how can I make this smaller? Uh, well, generally speaking, I think uh, the technology is going much better this week than it did last week. Uh, but I'm just wondering if I can move this bar out of the way. I'm just wondering if sharing the screen can't see where participants come in. Let me see if I can change that some kind of way. Nope, that did not help. Uh, can I do that? Yep. Okay. Smaller. All right. So anyway, Georgette, where are you? Karen, where are you? I uh, know Benita's not coming tonight. But anyway, I'm waiting on a couple of folks. And hopefully we're going to have a discussion on chapter three. Uh, space time is not straight uh, from the disordered cosmos. By Dr. Shonda Prescott Weinstein. And while we're waiting, I will go ahead and welcome you to the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. Uh, we are currently in session 18, meaning it is the 18th uh, public book discussion we've had under the name, the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. We've also had um, two or three or so private book discussions and two or three public discussions um, that were just one day events um, on special topics. Um, but for the most part, what we do is go chapter by chapter um, through books over a period of uh, 12 weeks or so, depending on book of course. So this is the 18th time we're doing a public book discussion and session 18 is meeting on Tuesdays. We started on April 18th and if all goes well and we don't have to change any dates, we should be here discussing this book until August 8th. Um, you can find our website called readingchangeslives.wordpress.com. And that website has a page for the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. It also has a couple of other pages. Um, sometimes uh, I host book groups uh, under different banners. One is called the Revolutionary Love Leadership Series. And another is called Reading for Change. 
Um, so there are pages there for that. Uh, it's also where we post blogs on various topics, uh, mostly related to the books we're currently reading. Um, there's a list there of books we've read and books we'd like to read and, um, you know, some other things you might find interesting. Um, we also have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel called the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. So uh, the current book that we're reading is called The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred, written by Dr. Shonda Prescott Weinstein. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, let's see. I'll give you the front flap, which says, from a star theoretical physicist, a journey into the world of particle physics and the cosmos, and a call for a more liberatory practice of science. In the disordered cosmos, Dr. Shonda Prescott Weinstein shares her love for physics from the standard model of particle physics and what lies beyond it to the physics of melanin in skin, to the latest theories of dark matter, all with a new spin informed by history, politics, and the wisdom of Star Trek. One of fewer than 100 Black American women to earn a PhD from a department of physics, Preston Weinstein presents a vision of the universe, is vibrant, buoyantly non-traditional, and grounded in Black feminist lineages. Prescott Weinstein urges us to recognize how science, like most fields, is rife with racism, misogyny, and other forms of oppression. She lays out a bold new approach to science and society. Oh, there's somebody. Uh, that begins with the belief that we all have a fundamental right to know and love the night sky. The disordered cosmos dreams into existence, a world that allows everyone to experience and understand the wonders of the universe. Admit. Okay. So it looks like we have some company now. So let me close some things and get back to the main screen. Hey there. Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> okay, how good, you doing? good. I'm good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> I, I was getting lonely over here. Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh, Gio, are you coming in? Oh, let me try to. Oh, I got all these screens open. It's giving me a headache. Oh. Hi, Gio. Hey, Gio, I think you're muted. Okay. Let me try to get myself together here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have been doing pretty well this week with the technology. We had a technology oh. disaster last week, Karen. Oh, no. <laughs> Where I could not get us <laughs> directed to the right live Hello? streaming page. Hello? Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah, it seemed like you're freezing, or is that me? It's probably me. That's usually what happens. But yeah, I couldn't get us to the right live streaming page um, for about 45 minutes. Oh, no. Oh. So I was determined to have a better week. And 
so far, I think it's, it's going okay. It's going All right. Okay. That's good. Cool. Good. Good. So while I was waiting for you guys, I was talking to myself and I was um, doing a welcome already. Okay. Um, I just didn't introduce myself. So I will say I'm Michelle Odom, uh, located in Brooklyn, New York. And next. I'm Karen Johnson, located in Atlanta, Georgia. Hello? Yes. Uh, did y'all hear me? You. Yep, we heard oh, okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Free- the screen Welcome. is freezing. Thank you. Okay. And I'm Georgette Moses, and I'm located in Columbia, South Carolina. All right. Great. All right. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I I did manage to get an agenda done, though, as you can see, I was posting it, I don't know, after five o'clock. <laughs> That's okay. So, I, it, it's hot off the presses, and, you know, it's not much, but a little bit to kind of... Um, something to start with um, um michelle can is it possible that you could put the agenda in word um uh, microsoft word or another um because i don't have the pdf i had it through my university so i don't have access to it anymore unless i pay for it really yeah um yeah, it's 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 done in Word. Um, let me see. Oh, it is. But even okay. If you, well, I'll I'll try again. I just no, no. What I what I upload PDF was the, yeah. I didn't. What I uploaded I was can. the yeah. If what I uploaded was the PDF, but it should be that that Google should give you an option to open it with okay. the PDF that's a part of Google. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but if not, let me know and um I'll try to get in the I'll try to get in the habit of just posting both both of them. Okay. But right now I don't have a um I haven't uploaded the Word document. Oh so okay. I don't have a link to share with you. Oh okay. um, sounds good. Well I guess I could send it as an attached file, right? But yeah, let me let me know if you can open the PDF. All right. Let me think. Um, um I don't see it on my iPad, but um I'll I'll look for it next time. It it should be in the comment section. Oh, okay. All right. Then I should have um, a problem. Okay, then I okay, that's good. Yeah, in the session 18 group. On the post that has the link to come into the Zoom. Okay, right. I see. Section it. there. Okay. Okay. Can, All right, that'll yeah. work. Yeah. That'll work. Okay. Mhm. Okay. Um, Jill, you got it. Yeah, I just, I just, I just got it. Mhm. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. You you want to read the summary, or you want me to do that? Oh no, I can. I can read that for you. Okay. Physics is an interestingly social phenomenon, and that has only become truer with time. The ideas that come to populate physics, especially the ones that stick, are rarely the product of one person's ideas, but rather the result of a community effort. Shonda Prescott Weinstein. Chapter three, space-time isn't straight. Of the disordered cosmos, a journey into dark matter, space-time, and dreams deferred. By Chanda Prescott Weinstein. Explores different ways of perceiving, experiencing, and calculating space and time, noting how the European approach is only one vantage. 
Discussing the Social Nature of Science, Dr. Prescott Weinstein reviews some of the different geometries humans have used to comprehend the nature of time and space, including Euclidean, Riemannian, and curvilinear geometries, and how calculus has benefited from many brilliant contributors. Our knowledge of space and time, which now recognizes space-time as a unified four-dimensional concept, bringing, three, bringing together three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, is the result of contributions by scientists, mathematicians, cultures, anthropologists, and hidden figures like Euclid, to the Palakura people, to Einstein and his first wife, Maliva Marik, to Gladys West, a Black woman who helped develop to develop GPS. Thank you. So, I don't know, is there anything anybody else would, would want to add as part of a summary statement? I, I'm I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was pretty excellent. <laughs> and I'm asking myself, what is the essence? What is the what is the key point that she's trying to communicate to us? Because surely she's not trying to turn us into physicists. <laughs> it got <Yeah>. deep. <laughs> And when she put in there that, that this was going to be the one equation that she included in the book, um, one of Einstein's equations, I said, all right, Shonda, I'm holding you. <laughs> I'm not trying to work through that one more of these calculus. <laughs> yeah. Um, it does read like a textbook that I would that you would use in an undergrad class maybe freshman class um, I appreciate how she attempts to help us understand um, physics and how she unpacks uh, a different kind of she's using a different lens I don't I'm not sure I didn't read actually I didn't read chapter one or two so I don't know what the theoretical lens that she's using to unpack and question um, these previous um, theorists, you know, who are indeed were, she's unpacking Western white masculinist ways of viewing the world. And I appreciate that. Right. Um, and I appreciate, to me, I'm looking at, she's using a, a hermeneutics kind of perspective because you're going in and you're questioning, you know, why is this the only way? You know, there's other perspectives. I like how she uses, uh, how she mentions the Maya, how she um, uses the, um, even the uh, women's cycle as a way to say, this is uh, another way that we could look at this in terms of studying science and space. That it's not just the Western masculinist Eurocentric way of looking at the world looking at the world. One thing that I did too when I was reading this and I looked in her index after she mentioned the Mayan and I wanted to see if she mentioned the Dogon people. Are you all familiar with them? They're in West yes. Africa in uh, an area called Mali. And the Dogons, what they did were, uh, they were very, very knowledgeable about astronomy and the suns and the stars, et cetera. And so they had uh, information on how they analyzed the stars. They had information about Sirius, A and B, it was a particular star. And I know that Westerners were saying, how did they know this? Did aliens tell them this? Or mm -hmm. some European must have come in there and told them this uh, information and not believe in that we, you know, African people are ancient people, gave birth to civilization, gave birth to humanity. Of course they would know this, right? Um, but um, one of the things that I really wish that she had included their understanding of space and time and astronomy, et cetera, the stars. I wish she had included that in this piece and it's not in there. They're not mentioned, they're not in her index. 
The other thing too right. is that I know she mentioned mine, and I do appreciate that. Um, but then it's the Ethiopians, they have a different kind of calendar. They have a different world. You know, these are ancient people. Mm -hmm. So that's my only kind of criticism that I wish you had she had used ancient African people um, knowledge as a way to present a different way of studying space and time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, that actually gets at the the first question um, on my on my list. Uh, let me see if I can share it. Agenda share. And let me read it. Uh, in the discussion on space and time, Dr. Prescott Weinstein delves into early European concepts of geometry, beginning with Euclid, the mathematician considered the father of geometry, who lived around 300 BC. Yet we know now that the pyramids at Giza, relics of Egypt's old kingdom era, were constructed some 4,500 years ago or 2,500 years BC. Any thoughts on why the pyramids don't show up in this discussion? And- uh, Yeah, that's a good point that you made. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, she does touch on in the earlier chapters, you know, the sort of Eurocentric nature of um, her own education. And, um, you know, so I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of which was, you know, in predominantly white atmospheres. And I think for a lot of Black people that, that have that experience, um, you know, you, re you reach a point in time where you, you realize that you've been inundated by a Eurocentric view and you go through some metamorphosis to try to um, learn more about your own or, or other cultures. Um, right. And, you know, so I don't know where she might be in that kind of journey in her life, but I think she's somewhere on that kind of a journey. And right. so um, I think it probably just didn't occur to her as, um, significant enough to, to start there, or it, it, it didn't strike her as odd to start off a discussion on geometry right. with Euclid. And, and, uh, and then perhaps she's not, you know, she's a brilliant woman, but perhaps she's not familiar with uh, ancient African understanding of this. Right. Or perhaps she assumed right. that the Egyptians, like a lot of people don't realize that on, in the seventh century, the Arabs came through North Africa long before the pyramids were built, right? Long before the ancient black Egyptians contributed to this. So I think that there was that lack of knowledge because if she had the knowledge, I'm sure she would have included it. She included the African-American women in there, right? So I don't think she has that knowledge of the Dogon right. or the knowledge of the ancient Egyptians and their contribution to this knowledge. Right, right, or, right. The ancient Egyptians as being black who contribute to this knowledge. That's what I mean. Right. Mm -hmm. And even right. the, um, the Moors who colonized uh, um, Spain for 700 years, they had knowledge yeah. of this kind of science. In West Africa, where you had the three, well, you had the major kingdoms like Mali, Sungai, and Ghana. Um, and in mm -hmm. Mali, at the University of Sankor uh, and Timbuktu, scholars from around the world, this one was one of the oldest universities in the world, came to study astrology and astronomy and, and, and um, things like that. 
So of the European side, they got it from these ancient Africans in their universities, right? And the ancient Egyptians where the Romans and Greeks talks about um, these black Africans that describe them as that and what they learned mm-hmm. from them. And then um, explorers such as, um, I can't think of the, they, uh, in West Africa, they wrote in their journals uh, studying in West Africa in these universities and what they learned from the West Africans, the Black Africans. And I emphasize that because people, again, assume that Northern Africa is different from Southern Africa when it was the continent, right? Um, and the people bringing this knowledge before the Arab invasion of um, North Africa. So yeah, she doesn't know this African history because if she did, then you would start from that perspective. I I think the thing is that, you know, African history is a specialized field of of knowledge, you know, we're not just born proficient at it. And so while some people were studying that, you know, she was studying physics and (laughs) she was studying physics from the Euro Europeans. Right. um, Right. And she totally not and it was not an integration. Um, right. You know, let's start from the beginning on the right, continent. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. Right. And you know, and I think that that that's what she was. That's what she's trying to bring to this book. Um. But you know, I mean, I don't know. You know how many African scholars helped to read the book you know, before it went to press, you know, right. so, so I think she's, I feel like we're kind of learning along with her on some of that stuff, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have any, um, any thoughts about it? Well, hmm. To, well, if you want Karen brought up some really salient points. There's such Mm -hmm. an extensive reference of historically ethnic, right? African, uh, um, Arab um, scientific knowledge that's out there. But is it recognized, right? Or do you have access to it? Mm -hmm. Um, Because the pyramids are more much many more thousands of years older than 4500 i think they're like 15 12 thousand okay. years there's a lot of um scientifically uh substantiated evidence that is still not accepted in the mainstream science communities because it just throws off their whole you know their little comfortable space in the world about how things are aligned so mm-hmm. you know whatever her beliefs are or or her or her access to the knowledge or <clears throat> acceptance of the knowledge you know we also have to include the possibility that maybe the editor is this her first book or yeah her okay first book. you know the editors are like well no china honey you can't be putting all of that in there you can put this little bit in here and then maybe mm-hmm. you know the second book you can go there with that but let's just get your book out there and bottom line is still making sales, right? It's still money. So it's got to be palatable to whatever the community that she's, you know, her publishers are targeting uh, also. So that, I think that might be, I mean, because we want to believe that people who have degrees and access and experience in these areas know a lot about a lot of different things, but maybe, maybe she doesn't. Or maybe they're not, she's not comfortable talking about it. Maybe if we had, you know, like over tea, she would say, yeah, the Dogon, but I couldn't put that in my book. You know, mm-hmm. I would like to give her the benefit of the doubt, you know, because she an, has an inquisitive mind, you know. Right. She has to have come across it somewhere. It was on Ancient Aliens. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> the, the Dogon yeah. has gone mainstream. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, even even in her discussion of the, the European view of space as space and time as distinct and space as linear, um, 
you know, even, even after there became more recognition that, that, uh, you know, the, the sphere, spherical nature, um, you know, she talks about how, how Riemannian um, geometry is still not really accepted um, or taught very much to students. It's like thrown in at the end of the, the course, um, even though that's what helps us understand the curved nature of lines. Um, and so I had a, a little comment in my margin that just said, just willful ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there, right, there's that too, because she, mm -hmm. she really um, reiterates the fact that this is a community, right? It's a social, and your ideas, they might be out there, and they could be correct, but if the community doesn't accept them, then they don't, they don't get a lot of traction, right? So, mm -hmm. so, there's still time for her. <laughs> There's still hope, you yeah. All right, so I have one question. Who, who's got another question? Um, oh, you mean reading, reading your question? Or no, just, that's something, something, you, something you thought about or found interesting in the text. Oh, let me see. Oh. Oh, well, I, I do know that she made a point about, um, you know, the different theorists. Remember, towards the end, she made a point about there are different theories, new theories out there that uh, tap into quantum leap gravity um, and also string theory and um, and that each theorist uh, pushed the idea that my theory may be better because A, B, and C. But one mm -hmm. thing that she said that I thought that made me say, say okay, I, I'm, first of all, I see what you're doing in terms of your, your method, in terms of laying out the groundwork and unpacking this Western masculine is Eurocentric way. But I walked away because she said something towards the end that I really appreciate. And that was one second. On page 65, uh, on page mm -hmm. 65, I would say one, two, three. Well, the last paragraph we said, do we as society have a quantum gravity problem? Uh, and I want to mm -hmm. jump down to that first line, but I want to jump down to, let me see, power to line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine on the ninth paragraph, where it starts off another way of asking this question that same question, as we as a society have a quantum gravity problem. And she says, Another way of asking this question is, Does it matter to humanity whether we know what the theory of quantum gravity is? And she said, I don't know, it's not clear that it mattered in 1910 that gravity hadn't been integrated into the theory of special relativity, but in the end, uniting the two led to interesting te technological developments like GPS, and augmentably, it deepened Western society's spiritual connection with the night sky. She so said, I tend to find mm -hmm. that each person, whether they are a scientist or not, gets excited about space-time and the fact that it's curved for different reasons. At least almost everyone seems to be intrigued by the question. So maybe it matters for humanity because we are total weirdos who would care. And so then I walked away because <laughs> I, was, I was listening to this book actually. And I was saying, okay, there's a lot of deep information. Um, I appreciate you unpacking this and looking at it from a different lens. But then I said, oh, this is like a textbook that I could have in a class. But when she raised that question at the end and said what um, relatively 
what gra- what is it uh, quantum gravity led to the mm-hmm. GPS, which is important, and people love for the sky and appreciation for space. Then I was saying, okay, now I see the value of you questioning and bringing us this information. And so I walked away kind of appreciating what she was doing in this piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that, that what she has done in the earlier chapters mm-hmm. and as well as this chapter um, is, is making the overall point that you never know where good ideals are going to come from. And, you know, white men do not hold the, the lock on good ideas. Um, and so I think that she's trying to make uh, other people of color who have, you know, you, you know, who may have been locked out or felt, um, you know, unequal to de- grappling with all of these concepts, I think that she's trying to break it down in a way that helps the rest of us feel like, well, you know, you, you, you might be able to handle this. You know, you might actually have something to add to and, and offer the field. And clearly uh, there remain, you know, many unanswered uh, questions in physics. Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do you? Oh, yeah. I highlighted that section too. And mm-hmm. I, I do agree. I agree with both of you. Because it's, you know, when you're, I, I can only assume that when you're dealing with the theories of numbers and the theories of theories that you're, you're, you're thinking on a, a different level, but when you can bring it back down to how is this relevant to everyday people living their lives in the past, in the present, in the future, then that spiritual piece, right? And she keeps mentioning in here in this chapter about the, the intuition, the intuitiveness, not only of the, of the, the different theories, right? And how she, some explanations of the theories, you know, it didn't quite gel with her. So she said her intuition uh, didn't m- match with the earlier theories that she was taught. But then when th- that she got into the more, um, oh, I'm searching for a word, um, eclectic theory right right <laughs> you know the, the mm-hmm. theories that are a little more less linear and then mm-hmm. more um, curvature and i'm just going to use that you know yeah as yeah a description I know of it she mm-hmm. felt more that yes this is more how i feel it should be and so the right. connection i think that the undertone of this uh chapter and I'm probably reaching for this, but Karen, you made when you mention all of those uh, cultures, it makes me think about how in our history, genetically, we know how things really work, but we're thinking too hard about them to, mm-hmm. you know, to make it make sense with the things that we've accepted in present day culture, right? what we've been told, westernized culture. When you look at ancient civilizations, you know, even the ones we're not regularly told about or exposed to, they already knew how things worked. You know, they may have, um, you know, the representations of them, be they hieroglyphs, you know, paintings on the wall, you know, or actual documents, you know, in papyrus or or whatever the uh, medium they were using or, or oral history, you know, they already knew how the world, the universe worked. They already knew there were parallel dimensions, but it was explained. The The language they used made it look like possibly something else to a mind who is trying to interpret it with their own cultural explanation. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it you really have, to, I think you really have to stretch to look outside of your, you know, the limitations of 
your 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 personal belief system to accept that possibly oh well you know maybe space time is it works like this it does work like a t-shirt with holes in it you know mm -hmm. and gravity is not what we think it is it's you know it's a particular kind of representation of some other forces that you know i don't really know exactly how they work but i have an idea of how they might work it mm -hmm. it, it opens you up to more possibilities mm -hmm. and so if you accept the fact that the scientists are still working it's all theories right they have to experiment to try to prove them and that's always based on some other theory that they accepted before then right mm -hmm. so it it opens up the possibility that what you've seen in historical documents from other cultures oh they knew what it was all the time they just had a different language for it so we thought it was a dance but it was actually <laughs> describing something else something physical something mathematical right mm -hmm. something universal so yeah so and, and kind of uh, along, well kind of along that line same line geo um i don't know i I um she doesn't she doesn't get it. I, I, I looked it up in the index. I don't see the word fractal in here. <laughs> um you know, and I'm like a total non-scientist, but I've always been just sort of intuitively drawn and, and noticing observant of patterns patterns in behavior, patterns in nature. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I look at the, the lines in my, the palm of my hand, you know, I see the branches of a tree, you know, the, that stuff has just always been very clear to me. So I think that at some, on some level, um, you don't have to be a trained scientist to make certain observations that are available to everyone that is alive. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, and so you may not have sophisticated language and or the, uh, the know-how with the, the equations and all of that. But at, like she uses the example of her menstrual cycle, but you still have certain experiences that teach you something about the nature of life. And all of us are not having the exactly same experiences like the menstrual cycle. You know, that's, that's one reason it's so difficult for um, the, the Eurocentric model to take in other perspectives because somehow they feel like, you know, their experience is the only valid experience, but nature knows that that's not true. And so this the part that Karen was pointing to, you know, whether or not any of this matters, like if we never learned anything about the physics of the cosmos, the physics would still be there. The cosmos would still be there. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't depend on our understanding of it. Um, so I was listening to, I guess I'll post it probably tomorrow, but I was listening to an um, interesting discussion on fractals yesterday by this guy, Baratunde something or other, who was talking to a psychologist who has applied um, the concept of fractals, which is a, a geometric concept. Um, she has applied it to her psychiatry practice, looking at patterns in people's childhood development and you know, how all of that plays out in the wider world and the political system. Um, and so it's a way of kind of tying together, um, you know, this sort of natural phenomena 
with what we see in politics and points to a, a way of changing um, society. So I always like science that, you know, where I can clearly see how it applies to and connects to everyday life. And so I like, you know, some of the examples that she gives in this book to, to just kind of, you know, help us see it's, it's not that complex. There are complex ways of thinking about it and, and calculating it and all that. Like Gio, I was thinking about that Venn diagram in the last chapter, Karen, there's mm -hmm. a Venn diagram, she says, is the most complex Venn diagram on earth. And it really is right here and it's there and it's there. And we were all like, oh no, I can't even look at this thing. But I was thinking about it later and I was thinking, you know, that's kind of like what things are like in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Just all over the place. And, you know, and I'm always talking about the complexity um, of, of life and how we get frustrated because we want things to be so simple. Mm -hmm. But, you know, reality is, is a highly complex thing. Mm -hmm. and and you know really too much to know <laughs> wow yeah I'm looking for that oh I see it now oh yeah yeah that's crazy <laughs> yes <laughs> wow welcome to my world <laughs> uh -huh. okay very interesting. <laughs> Do you have yeah. any questions? What did you find interesting in the chapter? Oh, hmm. <laughs> the, um, well, a couple of the theories, I'm like, wow. This is wild. Uh, and really trying to wrap my head around. There was one that was talking about that a thing is shorter when it's moving than when it's standing still. And I'm not sure her, her yeah. examples really helped me understand that any better. All right. It's about your yeah. point of reference. I'm like, because, you know, I remember art classes and perspective but I'm like okay <laughs> that that's something I'm going to need a video to help me you know see how these things are real different and the other thing was who was it ah there was a theory that starts with an m mm. oh my goodness and it was about curvature the curvature of space time and you're using Was it boxes. Man, there, yes, where you're using boxes, you know, reference uh -huh. boxes that go. And I'm like, I need to see that. I need to see a diagram of that to understand. Because she was very excited about that. She said, like, okay, but. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. You know, <laughs> that, yeah. 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 I will have to reread that to. Um, understand what she was trying to explain in regards to that because I wasn't I wasn't really grasping it that much as well that the situation that you talked about and it looks like you you have a question um Michelle on there relating to that where is that is it five and number seven uh let me see Oh, right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Number seven. Well, you have, right. Yeah, why don't time. you read number seven? Okay. Time dilation. Lamour, Lorentz, and Poincaré extended the length contraction hypothesis to include time dilation. If two different frames of reference have a relative speed, like a person on the street, 
corner and a person in a moving car. You disagree not about lengths, but also about times. Pages 53 to 54. How does this help us comprehend the different stories we get to witness to events like car accidents? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a wonderful question. <laughs> That's what it made me think about. And, you know, I always um, use this um, expression that, that one of my teachers used to use, um, which is where, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And whatever she would say that, uh oh, looks like I'm losing, I'm going to lose my internet, maybe. But whenever, whenever I would hear that expression, I would get the, the physical image of a baseball stadium. And, you know, people standing up to scream and cheer at whatever was happening on the field, and, and realizing that each person was seeing something in a slightly different way. Every, what they were saying was accurate from their angle, but they didn't have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was thinking about that as I was reading about that, that contraction. Well, okay, that's a good way of looking at it. I, I like that. Yeah. 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 And, and how, you know, on TV, whenever they're uh, interviewing eyewitnesses <laughs> at an accident, you know, you get all these different, uh, you know, and you want to say, well, were y'all in the same place? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. So it's it's like, what is our frame of reference? You know, what, right. is, what, right. is, what is our perspective? Right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And also memory have to play into mm -hmm. that as well. How your memory, uh -huh. you know, your memory and your perspective have to be, in my opinion, intersecting. How does your memory uh, interpret as well that particular right. situation? Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And, you know, and in here she's talking about um, the social and cultural context of, of, um, of, of how we get science, you know? Right, right. And, um, so, it's, so it's complex, right? A lot of different right. things go into why we see what we see, right. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and who is to say what is, what is right or what is wrong? Uh, one of her other questions, um, number five, this was her question. It says, which sense of time is the correct one? The one that marches forward and never repeats, which seems to be organized around the universal guarantee of decay, or the one that centers and recognizes uh, repetition, the author asks. And that, that statement comes after the whole discussion on menstrual cycles. Right. And I don't know, if I were in her class, I would, I would answer that by saying it, it's a both and, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's both forward and cyclical. And, you know, it's not a right or wrong. Um, and so much depends on the situation, depends on your perspective, you know, depends on a lot of stuff. It's relative. <laughs> you know? Right. So your lived experiences. Um, yeah. And I like, again, going back to how she uh, mentioned the Mayans. Uh, I wish she had mm -hmm. explored that even more in her chapter. She does a uh, uh, another edition of this, I think that she needs to unpack that piece with the Mayans, um, mm -hmm. understanding of, of 
um, how time repeats itself, is cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, even looking at, uh, like I say, perhaps the Ethiopian way of looking at time, uh, the mm -hmm. ancient people who are mm -hmm. on this planet, the people who have, you know, that's not Europe. And um, one, one other thing that I was going to say. Um, and then I think also well, she said she wasn't making a joke about CP time, right. but I wish she would, would have um, unpacked that more. Oh yeah, that unpack was, that more. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unpack that more because that might have tied to some African roots. And then when you go mm -hmm. to other ancient cultures, even today. Um, they make, like, if you go to Mexico, they joke about Mexican time and all of that. So it must be tied to uh, ancient cultural ways of knowing and being that is not mm -hmm. Eurocentric. Oh, the other thing I was going to say, that is not Eurocentric and it's probably also not masculine. It's not coming from a male perspective. Maybe it might be coming from a female way of understanding and being as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Karen, Absolutely. I like I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, having a baby and, you know, you say you're going to have a baby in nine months, but, you know, it might be eight and a half months, <laughs> might right. be a little longer. Right. <laughs> right. You know, right. women have right. had this, you know, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I, it's on time whenever I get there. Right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's right. <laughs> so, I, I had a question for Karen. Karen, could you tell us the Eth Ethiopian uh, belief in time, how that? Yeah, I had to read that a little bit more before. Uh, earlier today, I went and looked uh, on their calendar because they have a different calendar. Mm -hmm. um, but I need to go back and really get a better understanding of what it is. I don't have a strong grasp of what it is to share, but they do have a totally different calendar and um, than the Western calendar. And that's something I want to study even further because, you know, these are, uh, this, that's an ancient culture. What's an ancient culture? Indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But thanks for bringing it up because I'm going to look myself too. Oh, uh, I look up the Dogon. Oh, I, I want to, I really oh. want to, is D O G O N because they also understood, there's uh, ancient people who also understood Saturn, uh, and Jen uh, Ju uh, Juniper, uh, I'm sorry, Jupiter. I mean, they had wise knowledge. So I think you have to, when you do look it up, Try to just, you know, push aside all of the myths about them from a Eurocentric perspective, because you're going to get some that say, oh, that they talked to aliens and the aliens gave them this information. You know, that's racist or, or the Western, you know, came from the West. So I think, um, in fact, I was going to ask on Facebook, does anybody know a really good and truthful uh, book that tells you about the Dogan and their understanding of astronomy. Mm. Mm. Space. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Oh, what else? What else? Mm -hmm. Okay, in number six, you ask, it turns out that the Euclid, um, Euclid, Euclidean uh, Newtian way of looking at space and time, while often useful for doing calculations in certain scenarios, is in fact not entirely accurate. I will never know if I really believe that space and time were separate because of some kind of human intuition or just because the educational I was brought up in, educational system I was brought up in emphasized this with regularity. Uh, name an idea in the head that leads to wonder about where it comes from. 
Mm-hmm. Now, again, I was, it's just Eurocentric domination, colonization, uh, bringing their own way of viewing the world that is, again, very masculinist, very Eurocentric, uh, very coming from a way of thinking that um, we know that Europeans believe that the earth was flat. They didn't have no understanding of uh, how the earth operated. They didn't have no understanding of that. But when you look at ancient cultures, like ancient African cultures, or even um, a- ancient Asian, Asian cultures, or- um, excuse, me, excuse me, Karen, I will, I'll be right back. Oh, okay. Um, that these cultures understood the earth in a way that Europeans did not, okay? Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's why I like this book because she questions that, right? She has this hermeneutic of suspicion where she unpacks and questions all of this. Um, I didn't read chapters one and two. Does she bring in other, um, other ancient cultures besides the Mayans that are not Eurocentric to mm-hmm. help us understand and explore further? Uh, not specifically that I remember her mentioning this. I think this is the chapter where she begins to uh, specifically say some mm-hmm. peoples, different peoples, mention some peoples. Yeah, and so she mentions them, and I wonder if uh, someone that read the first draft of her manuscript, I wonder if they suggested, oh, she did say that she had an interview, or she read somebody's interview, but I think she puts that in there, not because she has the knowledge, because she doesn't, because she even said she doesn't, but because someone put that in her ear, hey, do you know that the Mayans, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so uh, I really hope that when she does another edition that she really brings that in and unpack that even further. What I'm seeing so far, just in chapter three, is a young, a person who was inquisitive. We see her, she kind of tells this story of her experience as an undergrad. And that's how I'm seeing this through the lens. I'm sitting in these classes and I'm questioning this and questioning that. Uh, but I wish that she draws on uh, to make it stronger and not seem like it's, um, to make it stronger and say, hey, I draw on these cultures as a way to push back on the Eurocentric and the masculinist way of understanding space. Yes. Are you all enjoying this book so far? It's interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the section that we're in, the first four chapters is called Just Physics. And then there are, I think, three more sections. Yeah. Um, yeah. Physics and the chosen few, and then the trouble with physicists, and then all our galactic relations. And so, you know, and so I, I don't know, I haven't read the book. But I suspect that we're getting so much physics, you know, in this first part, and that and that it will ease up <laughs> as we go on. Um, you know, I mean, you got to bring your A game with her. It's, this this is not it's not easy. It's not easy stuff. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, um, but but I'm but I'm hoping that she's using this first section to give us some of the key concepts in the field, you know, and that the rest of the book will be um, more more down to earth 
Uh, well, I do so, like that it's, it's accessible, easy language, um, and it is interesting. Uh, and I like that it is coming from, and, um, and at the end, I see she has a Black feminist. It is coming, it is using that kind of lens, a Black feminist lens to question mm -hmm. and unpack and provide a different way of looking at this. So that's good. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right. So I'm I'm guessing that the rest of the book might be more of applying, you know, um, applying that lens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the scientific world, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you know, I like learning, so I'm learning mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I don't know if you ask, are we enjoying it? I'm not quite ready to use that word. Oh yeah, okay, that's a good way. We're learning. It's very informative and very interesting. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> and it's very yes. accessible. Yeah, it's accessible. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. You know, it's successful. So, um, so I appreciate her for that. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. All right, what else? You want to do another question? Uh, oh, but number six, you asked, name an idea in your head that leads you to wonder about where it. Oh, that's right. I did talk about that. That's right. I did. Yeah, well, on that, on that question, though, I, I would I would say um, for me the thing that always comes to mind is religion. You know, because I grew up in a religious family, and they were not. You know, my father was a preacher, but it was not a um, uber religious. <laughs> kind of environment, you know, with real people with real strengths and weaknesses and, and that's how I, I understood it. Um, nevertheless, there, there was a belief in God and, you know, in certain, certain principles. And I personally no, and I, I think I said last week, I think as a part of the zeitgeist of our generation, you know, I feel like I'm um, a spiritual person, but not religious. But even to say that I'm spiritual makes me wonder how much of that comes from the family that I was raised in, as opposed to innate to me you know mm -hmm. um, and I don't know I don't you know I mean I think stuff like that is very hard to untangle mm -hmm. you, know? Yeah. you know and as you said before Karen you know there's just so much you know from the the European dominated educational system right you know I I don't think any of us in this system we have a clear idea on why we believe various things, right. you know, right? Because that twenty that, that twenty years or whatever it is through high school um, indoctrination, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, during your most formative years is a, a very intense experience, and you know, and that's why there's so much. Um, controversy and and politics and shenanigans going on always with the educational system particularly we see it right now with these you know sort of open efforts to ban books and courses and words and <laughs> mm -hmm. I, you know, because it's, you know, I guess humans have recognized for a long time that if you can take that first, you know, 17, 18 years of a person's life and, and, and pump them with whatever you want them to believe, it's going to be a long time, a hard road for them to 
come out of that if they mm-hmm. ever do. Right, right. Mm-hmm. That is true. Yeah. You know, um, I always think about this, this sort of Ferris wheel of capitalism, you know, where you're, you're supposed to get your education and, you know, get a job and, you know, get married and have 2.5 babies and, you know, buy a house and spend money and spend money and spend money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, and, you know, um, Oh, Michelle, you're frozen. Um, you know, and, and for so many people, by the time that they start to question it, you know, they're deep. coming back okay oh no Okay. All right, sorry, I'm back. Okay. Hey, well, I lost my my connection, which you know that was pretty good, Gio. Right? We've been on here for an hour and fifteen minutes. <laughs> Impressing you look. <laughs> I have some <so> expectations. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, what I've been saying, Karen, is is y'all know that if you see me lose the connection like that, uh-huh. I'm trying to get back in. And what I have learned is that it just impatient a little bit. Uh-huh. Zoom tries to restart itself. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you want to do another question? Sure. Let's see. Oh, how about number four? Um, I was thinking I kind of mention stuff with number four. Number four is good. I think I kind of mentioned that when I brought up, up about how the Europeans thought that the earth was flat and other ancient cultures um, did not. You want to read that, Gio? Oh, okay. Well, you want to read it, Karen? Okay. Ironically, for most of the 2000 years before 1800s, many astronomers assumed the space beyond Earth was a spherical. The um, origin of the idea of a celestial sphere actually seems pretty intuitive to me, yet two sets of beliefs about the nature of space were held simultaneously. The surface of the earth was curved and the surface of the sky was curved, but everything in between was flat. What might lead humans to believe the space beyond earth was spherical? Um, The thing is, 
like I said, the ancient cultures, like the Dogon, for thousands of years, when the Europeans were ignorant and not knowledgeable, already understood this, right? And like you mentioned the ancient Egyptians, she mentioned the Mayans, but even before the Mayans, you had the Olmec civilization. They are the mother civilization in Mexico. They had an understanding. We don't have a lot of documentation about the Olmecs, but the Olmecs had some kind of understanding because they built heads out of stone and they moved it from place to place. How did they do that? They had to have an understanding of geometry and things like that to um, move those headstones. So um, these ancient people were, uh, then probably even the, uh, oh, so in 2019, there's a, Renoko and I were in Peru. I didn't get a chance to do his uh, Manchu, Pichu, Manchu Pichu tour because I was teaching during the summer, but that ancient culture, that was with the Incas, right? The Manchu mm -hmm. Pichu. But thousands of years before the Incas was another ancient indigenous civilization. And that was the Mochu, the, what's it called? Mochu, the Mocha and the Chimnu. They lived thousands of years before them. And they built um, temples and pyramid-like structures a thousand years before the Incas mm -hmm. on what mm -hmm. would be the north, is this place in Trujillo, which is northeast of Lima. That's where you find these people in their culture. And so they have an understanding that the Europeans did mm -hmm. not. Uh, and I don't mm -hmm. have not studied a lot about ancient China so I can't mention that, but this is important to understand. And all of this knowledge, like she questioned, all of that needs to be included with any physics class. It's let's mm -hmm. integrate mm -hmm. these other thoughts and these other ideas mm -hmm. long before the Europeans. And let's not say that people from the space, aliens came down and taught these people. When I was in Mexico, <laughs> I saw signs that say over the Teotihuacan with the pyramids and outside of Mexico City. And there would be signs um, that said that the aliens did not build this. It was the <laughs> ancient indigenous peoples. I mean, and so that uh -huh. is so Western, that is so racist and so Eurocentric to have this assumption that these people who are right. older than you had this knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very important, and, right? Mm -hmm. Because when they on these different documentary programs, they show the precision of the masonry, right? And how how you can't even put a hair through, you know, these gaps. And how did how did they make a brick that's like curved in different shapes? And because you with your present day technology you would take all of the a great expense of energy right and mental uh, gymnastics to make it happen there are civilizations uh, uh, just because it's the term you know and i think it's part of a probably prejudice against the term indigenous right it's not synonymous with uneducated unable right non-technological there is a technology quite naturally because you keep discovering these structures that are were created far beyond the, what we're able to do today right uh, megalithic uh, structures that we can't even move and you wonder oh how could it be you know oh they couldn't possibly have but do we really know how many civilizations have been lost, right? Raised up with great ability mm -hmm. and then destroyed because of the cyclical nature of the planet, right? Cataclysms, global cataclysms. And then they have to start all over. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean they were stupid or they were using sticks and, and copper tools, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, that is, you know, the, the, un the inability of people to accept that what you've been led to believe, what you've been told is all there is. Mm -hmm. And so they can't accept that, oh, the Olmecs, well, how did they build these great, you know, these great stones or how, what are these huge spheres, right? I, and I think it's in, they have them in Peru and in um, Vietnam, you know, who built these spheres? They're perfect, right? Mm -hmm. But what are they made of? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know well what do they say if it's they don't understand it science looks like magic to people who don't know right mm -hmm. so science technology looks like I, alien intervention to people who don't wish to believe yeah yeah for me um this the simple um the simple way that I was thinking about that question, you know, what, what might lead early humans to think the earth was, was spherical was just, you know, you, you, you look at the sun, you look up at um, the moon at night, um, you observe uh, the cyclical nature of changing seasons, you know, um, or other circular objects like rocks, you know, circles are all around us, you know. Um, so it's not a leap for me that, that, that you know, that, that they could come to believe um, the earth might be round too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Right, right, yeah. right. You know, without the satellite technology, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, just, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, you know, I mean, long before modern science came along, you know, human beings were finding a way to survive, grow, and, and, and understand the world around them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we're the ones that have lost so much of that, you know, right. that has been, um, it has been assigned to specialists. Right, know? right. Um, and, um, but, you know, it, it, it used to be anybody, you know, your mama. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. Scientists in the family. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. All right. Any um, closing thoughts, final thoughts? Gratitude for Dr. Prescott Weinstein. Yeah, I do appreciate this book. Well, I appreciate what I read. I only just read this chapter. <laughs> I'm going to catch up soon. Yeah, catch up because it's not the kind of thing you want to get behind on, right, Jill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. But this, but the next because yeah, she would have lost in the sauce. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Karen's bringing some stuff. She brings stuff to she the table does. now. <laughs> she does. She does. And I did want to mention, um, Vanita. Um, you know, is also uh, a part of reading this book with us. At least I hope she's going to be able to continue. She's um, got some family stuff going on. That's why she couldn't be with us tonight. Okay. So I hope she gets it all worked out so that, um, so that she can continue with us. Vanita is somebody that's kind of like a natural scientist. You oh, know? okay. Um, you know, I, I, so I think having her, her reactions to this would be 
would it takes a different place to. Oh, okay, yeah. very good. Now I yeah. do have to mention that um, I'm I'm flying out to Salt Lake City um, this weekend coming up. The University of Utah will be celebrating retirees. And um, and so I retired in July of 2022. So uh-huh. they're, they're um, celebrating retirees from 2019 to 2023. You know, the pandemic, they lost those years. So I'll be flying out. Oh, I'm looking wow. forward to that, to being celebrated like that. <laughs> nice. So I won't be here next Tuesday. In fact, that's when the ceremony is next Tuesday. Oh, oh Tuesday okay. is a popular oh. day, but that's okay. You go enjoy your flowers, Kate. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you were able to join us tonight. And oh. you know, you added such depth. Oh, thank and you. Perception and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So I'll see you all in two weeks on chapter five, I guess. Yeah, five. On uh, the 16th, right? Yeah, May 16th. Uh, Let me just check. Next week, no, the 16th, we're taking a break. Oh, okay. Um, so we come back on May 23rd okay. and that'll be chapter five, the okay. physics of melon. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Okay. We'll see you in three weeks. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you got time yeah. to catch up, Karen? I do. Up? I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Okay. Y'all right. have Bye a good later. week. You too. Thank you. Karen. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.